Oh hi, I'm the heretic. So this video in March 22, 2016 tries to explain Marxism and how capitalism is contradictory and self-destructive. You know it's good because it features someone who has doctor in their name, Dr. Richard Wolff to be specific. Let's go! In a country that declared the end of socialism, a major poll released in January of 2016 revealed something unexpected. 43% of people under 30 in the U.S. view socialism favorably, compared to only 32% who view capitalism favorably. Of course they do. Indoctrinate kids in government schools for 12 to 13 years, plus four years of indoctrination in the Marxist echo chambers called university? It's actually amazing that the number is so low. All it really does is confirm what I already know, that millennials are realizing that they've been lied to their entire lives about the state, authority figures looking out for them, and the economy and unemployment prospects. They're looking for answers, but if all you know about Marxism comes from government schools and Marxist professors, it's going to look pretty attractive. Huh, I thought you were going to say millennials suck. Reality's a bit more complicated than that, except baby boomers. They all suck. And mole people. Screw mole people. Marx is considered the most influential philosopher to ever live. With his co-thinker Frederick Engels, they developed a way of understanding the world that has not only greatly contributed to the understanding of philosophy and economics, but also history, anthropology, political science, biology, and many other fields. Name me one thing, just one thing, that has been improved by cultural Marxism. I'd call it a contribution the same way the giant meteor contributed to biodiversity on Earth 65 million years ago, extremely destructively. As the US empire thrashes to survive the current global capitalist crisis. What capitalist crisis? Excuse me, let's rewind that bit. As the US empire thrashes to survive the current global capitalist crisis. And with rejection of capitalism clearly growing among young people, I wanted to find out what it was about Marx's work that has had such a profound impact from peasants in Asia, to miners in Africa, to workers in the US alike. How is finding out what makes Marxism so appealing relevant to the floundering of the American empire? So I talked to someone who's been teaching students and the public about Marxism for years, Dr. Richard Wolff, Professor of Economics Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Glad we got introductions out of the way. Nice to meet you, sir. I'm Filthy Heretic, Professor of Economics at STFU University, Illuminati Defector, Professional Autistic Lizard, and Full-Time Imbecile. You're a Marxist economist. An oxymoron if I've ever heard one. Forgive me if I cut stuff out. The full video is 35 minutes long, and if I replied to everything, I'd be here all day. Full video in the description. So, Professor, what is Marxism? It wants to see these problems, homelessness, inequality, an economy that bounces around having a recession or a depression every three to seven years, a society that concentrates political power in a tiny number. These recurring problems of capitalism, Marxism says, are built into the system. Here, we see the first problem with Marxism. They identify problems caused by the incentive government creates and project that onto capitalism. When they talk about overthrowing capitalism or overthrowing the government, the two are one in the same to them. But to be fair, I see where they're coming from. Our quasi-fascist economy makes it hard to tell where the state begins and where business ends. However, this straw man version of capitalism is what makes arguing with Marxists over these issues so difficult. I'm against corporatism too, but apparently I'm not allowed to be. No, the problems are systemic. So you have to understand how capitalism as a system works in order to begin to work your way to a solution. As I just explained, you definitely don't understand capitalism. For the next minute, Dr. Wolfenstein explains the history of Marx spelunking into philosophy and the metaphysical concepts such as deities and ideas that Marx learned and how they shaped the material world. More specifically, in the beginning, there was nothing. Then there was first God, which is a non-material idea, and that creates the world. Remember, in, in Genesis, seven days, God, a spirituality, creates the materiality of the world. Couldn't have said it better myself, Dr. Woofy. Marx rejected that. For him, the material is just as important as the ideal. If you want to see where the material comes from, it's shaped by ideas. But, and here comes his radicalism, it runs the other way too. 
For brevity's sake, I'll sum up his point. The real world material conditions shape ideas, just as much as ideas might change how people perceive these conditions. Marx referred to this as dialectical materialism. If nothing else, it's useful to understand someone's point of view, all the better to help us tear it apart. It's the real way human beings uh, make their food, solve their clothing problems, their relationship problems that shape their ideas as much. And he was going to analyze capitalism through that lens of the interaction of ideas and concrete material reality back and forth. An empirical framework takes theory, judges it by its results, and revises the theory according to those results. Is dialectical materialism an empirical framework? Let's see. The basic idea is that every economic system has in it conflicting forces. The language in Marxism is internal contradictions. It's disingenuous to call conflicts contradictions. A conflict is a debate between chocolate and strawberry ice cream. Strawberry ice cream is garbage, by the way. A contradiction is a debate between whether or not this is ice cream or a car. Of course there's going to be conflicts in communism. Are you kidding me? Now, will there be conflicts under capitalism? Yes. The difference is that under capitalism, those differences are resolved in ways that benefit everyone. So we had slavery, for example, in various parts of the world. It was born, it evolved, it had its contradictions. For example, the contradiction that the only way a slave system can continue is if you replace the slaves that reach old age and die, and that's become a big problem for many slave societies. Slavery is a double standard of property rights, suggesting that one group of people has property rights while the others do not for arbitrary reasons. Therefore, violating the Aristotelian rule of non-contradiction. I love how Dr. Doggy puts it though. The problem with slavery is that they get old. Let me give you an example of the kind of contradiction Marx found in capitalism that has been crucial for everybody else. I await with bated breath. Don't disappoint me, doggy. Every capitalist is always trying to either make more money or survive competitively by saving on his labor costs. Taxes. Regulations, customers, machinery, inventory, the aspects of running a business are legion, and all you want to do is talk about labor. Another capitalist does it by trying to get cheaper workers in place of more expensive ones, hiring women if they're less expensive to do the job that they used to pay men more for. Thank you for making my point why, if there was a gender wage gap, which there isn't, this benefits women. Bring immigrants rather than native folks moving to another part of the world where wages are much lower. We, we all, all know that. So capitalists are always trying to save on labor costs because they can make a better profit if they do that. These hiring decisions are not made in a vacuum. I can see why you would make this mistake since these reasons aren't obvious. But outsourcing is a result of government policies that make labor so expensive domestically, manufacturers figure that the cost of having those materials manufactured halfway across the world, complying with completely foreign laws, taxes and regulations, hiring lawyers for that specific reason, dealing with tariffs, hiring more lawyers, if applicable, as well as the cost of shipping those goods, navigating through customs and ports, is preferable to cutting out the dozens of middlemen and doing it all right in their own backyard. What does this say about government policies? Is that the working people have less and less money. And if they have less and less money, they can't buy what the capitalists are producing to sell. The, the capitalists, therefore, are destroying themselves, but they have no choice. They have to save on the labor outlay, and then that comes back and bites them in the rear end. Capitalists aren't doing that, though. It's called government policy. What's really being identified here is the conflict between capitalism and the state. And in 2008, the predictable happened. It turned out your fix only lasts for a while. For context, he appears to be blaming the 2008 financial crash on the existence of credit, which is absolutely absurd. The Community Reinvestment Act of the 1970s forced banks to lend to minorities who have higher than average poverty rates. 
to solve a problem that didn't exist called redlining, so it's all based on a lie. Off to a great start. Under the Clinton administration, the CRA was ramped up massively, and the government ran corporations Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which they used to buy up these bad loans, creating a moral hazard in banking that they could privatize the gains of taking out these bad loans while outsourcing the costs to the government. I'll give you three guesses as to what happened. Though predictably, status propaganda blamed the free market that never existed to begin with. BAM! Knowledge. That's just a brief overview of what happened. There's also loose monetary policy, New York's Attorney General Elliot Spitzer's prosecution of AIG beforehand, mark-to-market accounting rules. I might go into more detail in a later video, but the point is that Dr. Labrador is just wrong. The people on the other side of the political fence are very worried too. The political fence doesn't mean anything, but why wouldn't they be worried? They'll be literally murdered by the revolution. The housing crisis, you know, the crisis of overproduction, the fact that we have more houses than we do homeless people, but because you had this crisis of overproduction, too much of something was produced and people couldn't utilize it. I mean, talk about that concept and why this is an inescapable phenomenon under capitalism. The housing bubble had nothing to do with the overproduction of housing. That's ludicrous. If that were true, then supply and demand would dictate that the rise in housing prices in the OOs would not have happened, as oversupply would drive down housing prices, you know, benefit the poor. Workers noticing how productive capitalism was since they did the work, demanded for themselves a rising standard of living. So roughly, from 1820 to 1970, particularly in the United States but elsewhere, wages rose. That's what, over that time, capitalists were doing so well they could raise the wages of their workers and still make out like bandits. This is beautiful. The market demanding better stuff and suppliers giving it. Everybody's winning here. But Dr. Wolfen is still going to tell us why this is a bad thing somehow. So it was a system in which people began to get the idea Capitalism works. It delivers the goods because it raises wages. You had to not look at what was happening to where most people in the world lived, Asia, Africa, Latin America, because for them the situation was horrible. Yeah, because they aren't capitalists. In the rest of the world, which has been savaged by the growth of capitalism in those privileged areas, wages are very low. Savaged by capitalism? Really? That argument has no basis in logic, fact, or reality. Don't spit out a lie and just move on. That's disingenuous. So in this eureka moment, capitalists said, what are we doing here in the Western Europe, North America, and Japan? It's much more profitable if we produce in China, in India, in Brazil, anywhere else. I hate repeating myself, but the cost of exporting jobs is massive. Domestic labor has to become ridiculously expensive for that to even be remotely profitable, a problem that the government is more than happy to create. This is why you're a college professor and not in the free market making money. Because you get to cosplay as someone who's knowledgeable about business in the free market. And the system totters as it encounters a very old contradiction in its current form for which they have no solution. Abolish the state. Problem solved. Say, you know what this stupidity salad is missing? A nice, healthy dose of Trump derangement syndrome. And here in the United States, you see the, the kind of theatrical buffoonery, but there's more to it. Why is Trump such a character in the Republican? Why is that party literally tearing itself apart? Because it can't cope. You thought I was joking. And even the Democratic Party suddenly confronted with a socialist who isn't marginalized simply because he gives himself the name socialist. In fact, it makes him attractive. You mean the guy who was absolutely shafted by the Democrat National Committee to make way for the coronation of the anointed one, corruptocrat Herod and Clinton? Granted, at the time, we didn't know about that stuff, but he was definitely marginalized. The fact that he got popular support has to do with the fact that he actually stood for something. I think that people are starting to understand this and they're looking at things with the defense industry and they're saying, we need an enemy. We need to manufacture this enemy to keep the war machine going since Eisenhower. But Let me guess. The military-industrial complex, which can only exist supported by a state using stolen money, is capitalism's fault. It seems like a lot of more libertarian-minded people are saying it's just cronyism, right? Yes, we live in an empire. Yes, we need this constant 
enemy, but it's really just the crony aspect of capitalism and we just need to restore capitalism. You obviously go much deeper. How is all of this, especially the empire that we live in, directly related to capitalism? Yes, please enlighten us. Every time a system's in trouble, there are the defenders of the system who say, well, yes, I agree, right now it's really crappy, it's dangerous, it doesn't work. But that's because something has come in to destroy the really pure capitalism. If only we had that, it would work beautifully. So, you try again, and your retarded system fails. But that's okay, because it wasn't real socialism. So you try again, and your retarded system fails. But that's okay, because... It wasn't real socialism. So you try again and your retarded system fails, but that's okay, because it wasn't real socialism. So you try again. I understand it. That's a human, you want to hold on because changing systems is frankly scary, always has been. Okay, okay, okay. I wanted to at least try toning down my normal flippancy, but you just have to talk down to me, don't you, you arrogant jackass. You condescending know-it-all prick! Ugh, okay. I've had all I can stand with this guy. Don't worry, there will be a part two. But come the next video, the knives come out, and I will be coming for his throat. So what do you think? Did he raise any points you thought were interesting? Any points I failed to make? Leave a comment below, and thanks for watching, fellow heretics.